So, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this particular session. My name is Ken Titmus, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker this afternoon, Eric Bush. Um, Eric has led the growth of demand-driven technology since it was formed back in 2011. And under his leadership, the company has experienced exceptional growth and now supports clients on six continents around the world. He's led the development of a global network of channel partners who represent DD Tech Solutions in their respective markets while overseeing the migration of the solutions to a predominantly cloud-based offering. Eric retired from IBM in, in 2010 after 31 years of experience with the company, the majority of which was in executive and management positions. What she's going to talk about today is uh, demand-driven sales and operations planning. And I think throughout the manufacturing and distribution industries, companies have found the traditional approach to SNOP challenging to implement since it requires a robust management system and substantial organizational commitment to achieve results. Demand-driven SNOP focuses on building a business model driven by increased flexibility and adaptability providing an approach to SNOP which reduces SNOP workload while yielding improved results. So the takeaways from this afternoon's session will be to understand the distinction between the traditional sales and operations planning and demand-driven sales and operations planning and understand the critical importance of shifting the focus of SNOP towards building greater business agility and responsiveness. And also to understand the core principles of the demand-driven sales and operations planning process. So, Eric, over to you. Thanks so much, Ken, and uh, delighted to be with all of you today. Uh, really wish we could be face-to-face, -face, but uh, we're all doing our best to deal with this uh, COVID pandemic, and I hope all of you are, have been safe and healthy and uh, taking good care of your families and loved ones. Um, so, yes, we're going to talk about demand-driven sales and operations planning here. We're just going to be clipping the tops of the trees, uh, but we'll give you a perspective on what's really different about it in its mindset and approach. How does that differentiate from traditional sales and operations planning? And I think it really represents a path forward for all of us to take a different mindset and a much more flexible and adaptive uh, way of working that can reduce the level of organizational effort to get to the better results, improve your focus on really the true exceptions that need to be uh, uh, where your attention should be focused and, and kind of lighten the load, if you will, for everybody concerned. So from an agenda, we're gonna cover kind of just a reminder of the, the basic concepts of sales and operations planning. This should be familiar to most all of you, but uh, just for the sake of thoroughness, we'll go through kind of the founding principles. And it all makes quite a bit of sense when you look at it. Uh, but then we'll talk about where does it break down and what are some of the limitations. And that then will lead us into the discussion around DDS and OP. Um, we'll also talk a bit about what's called the demand-driven operating model because it's a foundational piece of the puzzle here that helps enable the DDS and OP process to come to life and really kind of focuses its activities. And we talk about next steps and how we move forward from there. So let's dive in. Um, obviously, with the concept of sales and operations planning, and uh, there's a conference uh, session coming up, I believe, directly after this one, on the adaptive SNOP with Carol Patak and Dick Ling, and I very much encourage you to participate in that one. Everybody had proper intentions, and all of the concepts of SNOP, I think there's a lot of really great thought into those. Those concepts have been around since the late 80s, I believe, and have really been utilized in a number of different ways by other organizations. And the principles are kind of the following. First of all, we have to have some idea of what we're going to try to sell into the market. And what came after companies had implemented MRP was, you know, it, which is based on, you know, show me your demand and I'll back schedule all the things you need to buy, assemble, manufacture, package and distribute to meet that demand. And it all makes logical sense. It's just a big calculator in a lot of ways. And as companies started using that in the 70s and 80s, they started to realize that they needed to get the sales 
and the operations sides working together. And that really became kind of the advent of sales and operations planning. And it was all about get them on the same page. Let's get aligned to what um, our material and operational requirements would be based on what we believe we're going to sell. We need to balance our demand and supply plans to address those market needs. Um, we want to improve our management of inventory. We want to have better coordination across the organization, you know, and kind of that overarching principle, let's get everybody on the same page, right? And so that then evolved into what's called sales and operations planning, which for most people um, involves the following activities, forecasting, demand planning, which is really a secondary step of forecasting, uh, the resulting supply planning, um, a process called a pre-SNOP meeting where the various stakeholders at the kind of the middle management and operational level are going to coordinate together to try to ensure that everybody's reviewed the respective plans and are in agreement on that being the, the plan that they want to take to the upper level of the business, which will then be reviewed and approved and finalized, and then we go off to execute. Now, before we get into these details, I just want to share some anecdotes from my experience. So my job um, near the end of my career with IBM, I was the vice president of operations for the consulting division known as Global Business Services in North America and then subsequently over in Europe uh, after we had brought, bought PricewaterhouseCoopers. Um, the consulting division at IBM at that point had evolved to tens of thousands of people. We had uh, somewhere around 25,000 people across the business in Europe. Um, and one of the challenging uh, issues that we were facing there was this is in the 2003, mid 2000 to 2003 to 2005 timeframe, was the alignment of our inventory of skills um, to meet the market demand. So consulting is all about having the right people with the right skills to meet the market need. If you reflect back on that time, and for some of you, this is going way back, um, there was a lot of change happening in the market. Um, we just passed the Y2K period. Uh, a lot of the new e-business technologies or web-based solutions were starting to become predominant. ERP was still continuing to be a big space. And what we found, especially after we kind of consolidated the organization between IBM's consulting business and that of PricewaterhouseCoopers, was that we had these imbalances and we needed to realign our capacity of skills. Think of this as the inventory of your skills to what the market was requiring. Uh, we put in some very important demand driven concepts, but the IBM's sales and operations process required quite an extensive alignment. It was driven largely by finance to meet the expected uh, revenue and profitability goals in the coming year. It was called the fall plan and it started in July. So it was actually the summer plan that turned into the fall plan. And it took several months to execute and it finalized with the budgets for the subsequent year. Uh, we spent an immense amount of time on this and there was reviews around which practice areas needed to grow skills. What were the growth targets for the company? How were we going to improve profitability and all of these things? And it was incredibly challenging. And because of our role and because of my role in the company, I also had exposure to what our clients, especially in the manufacturing and distribution industries were doing. And it was very, very similar in terms of the principles. And yet what we would constantly find is that that process would yield substantial gaps and misalignments between skill areas that were overstocked which then obviously you need to figure out, can we retrain people and put them into other areas? While at the same time, you've got areas that you didn't have enough capacity in and revenue opportunities were being missed in, in the same way. And so there's a lot of, you know, real <laughs> kind of worn in kind of experience that I've got in this area that just in spite of everyone's good intentions, we found that there were fundamental gaps. So let's talk about the process that companies go through real quickly, and then we'll get into kind of the way forward. Forecasting is obviously the starting point. What are we going to sell going forward? Oftentimes, it's going to be based on your historical demand as a baseline. There's typically going to be input from sales, from marketing, from new products that may be coming along, new markets that you're entering. And there's a fair bit of activity that goes into adjusting that to 
incorporate these internal and external factors that we think are going to adjust what we've done historically. And there's quite a bit of activity that goes around this. Some companies are very based on statistical forecasts of what their historical run rates have been. Others do more of a bottoms up. You know, it's kind of going to be the flavor of the month, depending on the type of organization and the type of market that you're involved in. But you have to have this. You have to have some kind of a view because you're going to need that whether you're doing traditional SNOP or DDSNOP. We'll talk about those differences here in a minute. Some companies, especially in the heavy consumer goods areas, have a function called demand planning, which is kind of the next wave of evolution of forecasting, where there is dedicated resources that are taking the forecast and reviewing, analyzing, and making further adjustments. Um, the, the demand planning function can be quite quite substantial in certain organizations or maybe much smaller in others, but it's really there to kind of finalize what is the demand plan we're going to take forward as we go through the SNOP process. There's a socialization activity that occurs. Upper management may be taking a look. We may be dealing with other stakeholders in the organization and, and gathering that feedback. But what we're trying to get to is an agreed to, often termed consensus plan that we'll be using to then drive what our supply and operational plans will be. Supply planning then is the corollary to that, but looking at it from the standpoint, okay, based on our demand plan that we have coming through, what are our supply requirements going to be? Our vendors, our collaboration efforts with our suppliers will require that we give them some idea of what our expectations, because they're going to be going through a similar activity on their own side to ensure that they've got capabilities lined up to meet the expected requirements from their customers. And so the supply plan is critical to that. It's not just the materials we're going to need, but it's also about not only our capacity as a company and a manufacturer, but our, our supplier's capacity. Um, clearly, in the COVID conditions, we're seeing major issues out there. You know, uh, we've heard of container shortages uh, worldwide that are limiting supply and people are taking, you know, aggressive actions to try to counteract that. In the automotive industry, there are chip supply issues. Um, and pretty much everywhere you look, you're finding examples where the supply plans and the demand plans are just vastly out of sync because of the COVID uh, kind of implications that we've run into where, you know, in some cases there's hoarding going on. We all remember the challenges of getting toilet paper in the early COVID days. Um, and it's kind of, in essence, we're finding ourselves in the middle of the bullwhip here. And so the supply planning activity is a very, very important uh, component of the SNOP process. Again, it's about building alignment. Let's get lined up to what our demand plan is. Let's make sure our suppliers are lined up. Let's try to get everybody on the same page. Eventually, we're going to get to what's called the pre-SNOP meeting. And this would be where you've got a formalized process where there is either a monthly or a quarterly schedule. This is all driven by a cadence that you're operating on. Finance, sales, marketing, operations, product management are going to work together to try to get to a confirmed plan that will get ratified uh, by the executive committee uh, following this meeting. So you're going to do a drains up. You're going to review your forecast, your demand plan, the supply plan. Uh, there will be obviously observations around constraints and risks um, that will be compared to historic results and achievement rates. And we're going to try to have a, an agreement as to what our operational plan will be going in to meet with our executives. That kind of is the culminating step in the process. There's a due date, an impending event that everybody's driving for to make sure that they're all prepped and ready to have the discussion at the executive SNOP meeting. And eventually that plan gets approved and ratified, and the goal is to go out and execute now. We're going to take our plan and we're going to go drive it into the market and, and um, you know, hope for the best that everything is going to work out well. But what happens along the way? Now, this planning process can take weeks. It can take months. In IBM's case, it was more of an annual plan. It can take many, many months. Um, things break down. While we're building the plan, things are continuing to change and people struggle to go back. The forecasts are never quite right. And we've seen this become, I think, an increasing problem driven largely by 
product proliferation in the market. The more products we have, the more we tend to now start to do the forecast and demand plan in buckets of segments, maybe product families instead of the items themselves. We may do things in months instead of weeks or quarters instead of months. We do other things because trying to deal with all of the information that represents all of the things we're selling into the market and all of the operational dependencies that go along with that starts to become a rather onerous task. And it becomes very, very challenging. And while we're doing it, as time is passing, the core fundamental business market, uh, business conditions and market conditions are continuing to evolve. And so keeping those, you know, constantly in alignment becomes very difficult. So the forecast and demand plan is never quite right. We, we end up on the supply side with what we call in the demand driven area, bimodal inventory, too much of the wrong and too little of the right. When we have too much, then, you know, we, we are obviously carrying a lot of excess working capital that we shouldn't have to have. We, when, when we don't have enough, we are missing revenue opportunities and customer satisfaction opportunities. And so this typically then evolves into a lot of firefighting actions being taken to um, address that misalignment. And, you know, the, in, in essence, you find yourself living in the middle of the bullwhip, you know, as we all are in many ways in, in the COVID conditions today. Suppliers are eventually feeling it as well because they're trying to react as quickly as they can to address the changing needs that your company has. It gets very, very, very challenging. What then happens after you do this for a while? Now, unfortunately, the process starts to lose credibility within the organization. People feel like, hey, we, we all put our good hearts and minds into this. People start to have a skeptical view of whether they're going to get any value out of it. Maybe they're not as paying as much attention. Um, confidence in the process erodes. Senior leadership gets frustrated with the level of effort that they're spending. And it becomes not so much of a, you know, energize, we're going to go figure this out to where people kind of tolerate the process. Meanwhile, on the back channels, they're taking other corrective actions on their own, trying to, you know, mitigate and and get around what they expect will be their resulting um, challenges that they experience. And so, you know, what's what's happening here is, is that we're trying to get aligned to an uncertain future. And we're spending a great deal of time and energy to try to get that done. And maybe we're not accepting the fact that we don't really know what's going to happen. We have good ideas. We may be close on the total revenue, but when you really break it down to how we did at the item level, we're going to be we're going to see some that are doing way better than they were expected to. We're going to see others that are way behind. And that's that variance that really become, becomes kind of the, the core unhooking element here that we want to try to counteract. So, you know, all of these things are kind of there. I think every client that I've talked to has kind of said, yep, that's kind of what we've experienced. Uh, a very senior executive at an extremely well-known global company in the consumer goods space told me that they pretty much gave up on SNOP 20 years ago because of these very issues. So I think there's a lot of awareness and buy-in to the problem statement that I've posed here. And so let's talk about what we might do differently. So I think it's a fundamental looking at the pro same problem, but from a very different angle. And so this is kind of a way to kind of juxtapose those two perspectives. We go from, you know, trying to get aligned to that uncertain future. We do our best to get the forecast and demand plan. We get consensus on, yep, we think this is the best view that we're going to try to run against. We then try to build a supply pan, plan to that. Um, but in reality, what we're doing is on the bigger scale, we're taking some of the issues of traditional MRP, where we know about the bullwhip effect and how dependent it is. Everything is tied together. So we have all these tightly coupled uh, dependencies that cause the bullwhip effect to cause these misalignments. So while in, in theory, it all sounds very logical. I build a consensus uh, demand plan. I align my supply plan to that. I, I talk about risk and contingencies, but I'm really basically lined up to one view of the future. And I call it like the aligning, you know, the stars and the planets. It's celestial alignment. And depending on the company and how aggressive they are about SNOP, 
this can become a really heavy weight uh, level of effort to try to accomplish. Instead, if we take a more demand driven approach, if we take a more approach focused on the reality that the future is uncertain. So what we want to do instead is instead of building alignment in our business, let's build agility. Let's build the ability to respond to what comes our way, because the more effective we do that, think about this, you know, uh, Ellie Goldratt used to uh, quote Archimedes, who said, you know, give me a lever long enough and a place to stand and I can move the world. Right. You know, because it's basic physics kind of a concept. Well, if we had in the same way ultimate flexibility, we wouldn't need a forecast. We would be positioned to respond to whatever came in our direction. So any movement we make in that direction arguably is going to give us a lot more resilience and a lot more ability to respond to that uncertain future that we know is going to exist, right? So let's focus, change our focus from alignment to agility. Let's look at a range of scenarios and let's look for where there are exceptions to our operating model that will cause us concern. Because if we can pace to actual demand in the market, it's the most accurate signal we're ever going to get. It takes away a big bunch of that noise from uh, variance to forecast. We are arguably, arguably going to be in a much better condition. And the way I think about this, you know, I've flown around the world a lot in uh, my job over the years. And it's amazing to me that, you know, knowing that the pilot is rarely actually flying the plane, you know, systems are doing the job. So it should be more about exception management. The pilot gets involved in landing, takeoff. If there's a storm and we need to navigate around, if there's other uh, issues that erupt during the flight, their job is to identify those and, and take an exception management approach. But otherwise, let the system do the work for us, right? And so we want to really focus on building that type of an agility. So the question becomes, how do you do that, right? Easier said than done, without a doubt. But there are absolute strategies that we've seen working with our clients that I think everyone can take advantage of and use to get themselves to a better place. It starts with what we call the demand-driven operating model. Many of you should have heard about demand-driven MRP. It's aligning the materials and inventory side of the equation. The whole principle here is that items that are buffered with DDMRP logic, the stock buffers are there to ensure constant availability. If we have constant availability of the materials, then we can pace to actual demand. We don't need to predict the future. The question becomes then, how do we do that? Well, it's about understanding variation. Items that have higher variation need heavier buffers. Items with lower variation need smaller buffers. The lead times have an impact on all of this as well, but we have proven time and time and time again that companies are able to get to a better service level, better availability of materials, and reduced inventory by using DDMRP. So if we can have our stock buffer set up in the operating model, at least the material side of that equation is much more agile than it would have been without um, this demand-driven approach. The other side of the equation in the operating model is capacity scheduling and operations. How do we deal with that? And there we're using time buffers, which protect the uh, in, and ensure that the work is available for the resource when it's due to be run on that machine or resource and capacity buffers, which ensure that we have enough other flexibility within our operating environment to deal with peaks and valleys as they come along. Time and capacity buffers in operations allow us to deal with variation effectively, much the same as a stock buffer will on the material side. So. When we bring these two elements together, we have what we call the demand-driven operating model. And the principle of the demand-driven operating model is you're pacing to actual consumption, meaning it's designed to be agile and flexible. And whatever comes our way, we're gonna be able to deal with, okay? So this is foundational to DDS and OP. If you tried to do DDS and OP without addressing this layer, you're not gonna be able to get there because the conventional techniques and systems don't really support this kind of a perspective and mindset. The demand-driven operating model fits within what's called the demand-driven ad adaptive enterprise model. That's what Carol and uh, Dick Ling are gonna be talking about, I believe in the next session. It's the left side of the equation. So the way I like to position this chart, every company has to have a forecast. I, you will never hear me discredit the need for a forecast. You have to have some idea of where you're going uh, into the future. On the long range, that forecast will help you determine if you need a new plant 
or if you need to enter a new market or if you need new suppliers, more large grain kind of questions that are really on the adaptive SNOP. On the left side, demand-driven operating model says we're pacing to actual demand. So what we care about with demand-driven SNOP right in the middle of this picture is not going back to MPS or APS. It's about using those insights that we're gaining from our forecast to test our demand-driven operating model. Does it have the resilience, given the expected conditions that we have coming down the road, to be able to deal with those if and when they arrive? Because if we make those tests and we validate that we have that capability, then we know that our operating model can be allowed to continue to fly on its own because it's been configured in such a way that I don't need to have my hands on the wheel. And I think that's such a different mindset than where we've been for so many decades now. So it's about model configuration. When you get into the details around this process, it's called master settings. So we think about our buffer profile settings, our capacity settings, our shift schedules and things like that. That's, those are the underlying ingredients that go into our demand-driven operating model. At the same time, we've gained experience. Variance analysis helps us understand for the preceding periods, did the model behave correctly? Were there areas that we can improve and adjust on? So you get a continuous improvement loop that you're establishing here that allows you to have a much more resilient environment available for you. And if you have that resilience, now all of a sudden the weight of your SNOP process becomes much lighter because now it's going to be about testing for range conditions. They talk a lot, Carol and Dick will talk about relevant ranges and what time horizons we really need to worry about. It means that you don't start planning today for something 26 weeks down the road. If you have a cumulative lead time of only eight or nine weeks, let the time pass, see what that picture changes. Let's react when we need to, you know, in the old adage, don't shoot before you see the whites of their eyes, you know, let's wait until we get close enough to the action because very much from the theory of constraints, the longer we can wait to, before we take an action, the more accurate that action will be. Okay, so we're trying to build that concept of agility and flexibility into our approach. And that's really what DDS and OP is about. We're going to do the tactical review. We're going to analyze how our stock buffers had performed historically. And by the way, these are charts from the DDI. You, you'll definitely want to look at their material because they really are the thought leaders on the, the core concepts that we're talking about here. On the production side, we're going to assess our capacity and time buffers. How did they perform? Are there improvements that we can make to our routings, our run rates, our setup times? Um, do we need more capacity here or there? We're going to be looking at the environment in that kind of concept because what we're trying to do again is use this variance analysis and the model configuration activities to ensure that resilience in our operating model, which if we've done that well, makes our whole SNLP process much more effective. This concept of relevant ranges is essential. It's about finding where to focus. Instead of celestial alignment, let's work on finding those things that really matter. It doesn't mean you've got to go 78 weeks out into the future for DDS and OP. It's really more about your cumulative lead times, plus maybe a little bit of a time buffer there to ensure that you've got time to react and operating within that kind of a window. When we do that, we get better focus. We've got better insights because the closer we are to the action, um, the more accurate our estimations will be. A lot of times in conventional SNOP, it's all about one unified plan instead of looking at a range of possibilities. So you want to be able to test different scenarios. So we're working with some of our clients today and doing these kind of range assessments because like in the automotive industry, as this chip shortage starts to settle down, they're going to start to accelerate again. And that means that you've got to make sure that your buffers are going to be resilient. And we've been able to demonstrate that to clients. So, yep, you're going to be fine even if the business grows by 20% over your current forecast. And so you're able now to test parameters. You can look at that on the material side. You can look at that from a production scheduling side. You can do rough cut capacity planning. But you're again looking for where does the system break down? If we exceed our forecast, where do we have excess uh, you know, capacity that we may be able to exploit? Because it may point to some other things that we could do in the way we're testing these scenarios to take advantage of the fact that we may have latent capacity 
that could be sold in a different way to drive more revenue and profitability within the tactical horizon. So you want to use range estimates. You want to use them in the context of this assessment of our overall demand-driven operating model. And that's going to give you a much, much better way of working. So this is a way you can do that for inventory projections. You can do the same thing with capacity planning. Um, it's about these master settings. It's not about, you know, kind of an NPS aligned approach. It's about looking at ensuring that our operating model is resilient. And if we do that well, we're going to be very, very well served going forward. This is the same view for capacity. Now we can see where we've got peaks and valleys. We can see where we may need um, some additional resource perhaps additional shift schedules, or we may need to outsource some capacity requirements so we can get insights on when those conditions may emerge. So I, I've tried to clip the treetops here, but I, I can tell you in certainty that there is a better way here. It, it doesn't, it's, it's so different than, you know, the traditional way of we all want to have a good plan and we try to predict the future. The, the, the flaw in that is that the future is going to be different than we expected. Every one of us in the fall of 2019 did not know there was going to be a pandemic and what was coming. And those are world changing kind of incredibly disruptive events. But at a micro level, things happen in everyone's markets. All of your markets are evolving and changing. And that's kind of the organic nature of things out there in the marketplace. If we can build more resilience, we can build more opportunity to pace to actual demand. That's the most accurate signal you're ever going to find. There will never be a more accurate demand signal than the actual orders you get from your customers. So if you configure your demand-driven operating model using DDMRP for materials and demand-driven capacity scheduling for production, scheduling, and execution, you're taking a huge first step in getting position to not only do a better job of pacing to what the market's going to expect from your company, but also to making putting yourself in position to have a much more effective way of doing sales and operations planning. So hopefully you find some kernels of this message that you can kind of hang your hat on and, and create a path forward. There is a massive amount of education and um, other uh, support available. Um, I am a true believer in exception oriented management. I've just had too many scars from all of the other techniques to, to not, you know, see that this is really a much, much better way to go. It's going to reduce the effort, improves your focus on where the critical priorities are. The range estimates allow you to test your DDOM in a very effective way around both materials and capacity requirements. It allows your management team to focus on where agility and responsiveness can be created. If everything is so dialed down to one specific plan, you're, you're inviting challenges and you don't want to be in that kind of a situation. And obviously here you're reducing your dependence on a flawed signal. You still need a forecast. You still need some kind of an expectation, but now you're going to take a different way. You're going to build in, you know, that insulation you need so that that forecast error that's inevitably going to come through doesn't cause the disruptions in your environment that would normally have. People find that this process gains more confidence. They start to feel like they, they understand where the touch points are and inflection points are. And at the end of the day, it's a much lighter weight way of going about this, and it's going to give you better results. So again, my thanks. I uh, borrowed some of the charts from the Demand Driven Institute's presentations. Um, they have a tremendous amount of information out there on DDS and OP, on adaptive sales and operations planning. And so I uh, encourage you to take advantage of that. We also have uh, DD Tech is sponsoring a um, flow sim game opportunity. So if you're not real uh, familiar with the Mandarin MRP, I would encourage you to look into that. And we can help you get uh, directed to that event, which I think is coming up in September. Right, Ken? Uh, that is correct, uh, Eric. I haven't got the exact date. It's somewhere around about the 22nd. But if yeah. uh, people go to the SAPEX website and go to events, they will they will find it in September there. Yep. Uh, Eric, yeah, thanks very much. Um, we've got one or two questions here. One from uh, Gerhard. Um, how would you adjust your buffers in anticipation of seasonal demand, i.e. building inventory before actual demand exists? 
And what inputs will trigger the recalculation of those buffers? Okay, great question. So there's a number of techniques that you can utilize for that. You can, first of all, size your buffers based on a forecasted rate of demand. The actual consumption of those buffers is still going to be based on true demand. So in many cases, just simply using a forward daily usage value, a forecasted daily usage value set on an appropriate horizon will allow you to do that. There may be, though, peak season environments, um, uh, for example, where it's a very pronounced event. Um, we worked in uh, some Muslim countries where Ramadan was a, a critical period. And on food products, you know, there's a very strict change. So you have to oftentimes pre-build. So you want to use that forecast. Uh, for example, uh, we do this through our advanced planning module where it allows you to project your buffer activities forward based on that. It also allows you to see the implications on capacity, which then would indicate where you need to do pre-builds. And you'd have the adjustment factors and other techniques for doing that. For You may encounter this with promotions like in a beverage company where you have to, uh, you know, you have a campaign that's going to run through the retail channel for a given two-week period, perhaps around a sporting event or something like that. Uh, there's quite a few tools that are available within uh, the methodology and like in our software to allow you to address those. Then you continue to monitor them. Once you set up those adjustments, you keep an eye on them because they may, those requirements may evolve, but they are quite effective in uh, allowing you to deal with those exceptional events while at the same time allowing the system to do the demand-driven planning throughout the rest of the period. Hopefully that helps answer that question. Yeah, thanks, uh, Eric. There's another one from Bill here. He says, for a company implementing DDMOP, what is the major takeaway for the procurement team? Well, there's several. I, I think for the procurement team, what they find is uh, a couple things. I can't tell you how many of our clients have said that their supplier performance improved, their supplier performance improved when the company went on DDMRP because by buffering their purchased end items, the, res the result of that was they gave their suppliers a more re reliable signal. When they, the buffer needed replenishment, it needed replenishment, and they could count on that order from the customer coming to the supplier now to be more uh, firm, you know, there, it, that it wouldn't change. So stability of those supplier expectations tends to lead to better supplier performance because they know and have more confidence in it. Um, it also opens the doors for other opportunities, things like, you know, tighter collaboration in our software. And I think some of the other softwares that are out there, the vendor can actually see the stock position because it's based in the cloud. You can give them access to the software and it opens the door for a very convenient way of collaborating. Because as they're monitoring the items that they're supplying to your company, they may say, hey, you know, I can see you're about to order in the next few days this material. We've got an opening in our schedule today. Should we go ahead and run that? Because it'll improve their efficiency and it just, it's, it's based on, you know, what they know will be a need that will come in the next few days. So I think we've seen over and over again, many companies start their DDMRP journey with uh, doing purchased items to begin with. It, it's going to decouple your lead times from your suppliers. It's going to give them a more reliable signal. And if you're ready for more vendor collaboration, it opens some doors for sharing information that can further, you know, cement those relationships. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. We're coming to the end of the session now. We haven't got any more questions. I would just like to remind uh, those people online to fill in the poll and evaluate the presentation. If they go into the handouts, they'll find some information on the Flow Sim game. Uh, register early because we only have 36 seats available. So it's first come, first served. And just a reminder to everyone that uh, the videos will be available of the presentations over the weekend. So if you go to the sessions and the old sessions, you'll see there, there should be on, on most of them now, there's a little playback button. You can go and hit the playback button and listen to the, or view the presentation. Uh, they will be downloaded ultimately and put onto the SAPEX uh, YouTube channel at some stage. But uh, I know Eric has to rush off now. If you've got any queries about demand-driven, 
you can always contact us at uh, Demand Driven Africa. And we do have a uh, exhibition stand at the conference. Uh, if we're not there, just leave a message and we can get, get hold of you later on. So, yeah, uh, thank you, Eric. And, um, thanks, Ken. Yeah, and, uh, thanks, everyone, we'll for your time. We'll see you again soon. <laughs> okay. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, then. Have a great okay. day. Okay, bye. -bye. bye. And by the way, guys, don't forget Carol and Dick is on next with a um, keynote address in 10 minutes' time.